Welcome back to Tack and Track. I'm Brad and today we're going to be talking about the Browning 1911-22LR. If you haven't seen one of these yet, they've been floating around the internet. Uh, they've been super popular for a lot of guys because this is Browning's first recent 1911 that they've come out with. Now, since this came out, they've also come out with this same gun in 380 instead of 22. But if you don't know, John Moses Browning designed the 1911. So to see his company coming back out with a 1911 was a really cool piece of history that I absolutely had to have. With that being said, somewhat disappointed in this gun, and we'll talk a little bit about why and some of the mistakes that, uh, that I made that I hope that you guys can avoid making when looking for a 1911 caliber 22. You can't talk about this gun without talking about its size. So if you don't know, these guys are 85% the size of a normal 1911. Browning took the original design schematics for the 1911, they scaled it down to 85% and you get this guy here. So just for a size comparison for you here, I've got a full size 1911 government 45 here. This is Magnum Research 1911G. And then we've got the Browning right here. As we can see, the Browning is significantly smaller than the full size model. However, all the controls, all the takedown and everything it's just like what we see on a normal 1911. So we always rate all the guns here on Tack and Track in five categories. First of which is always value. So let's talk about that because this is one of the parts where this gun does quite poorly. So these have an original MSRP of about $695. There's a few different ways you can get this. This has the polymer lower receiver on it. Uh, you can also get them in all aluminum. But this is the polymer model here. $695 is a lot of money for a 22. I mean, it is, it is very expensive. And for that, I expect a very good gun. I also expect a 1911 coming from Browning to be an exceptionally good gun. This gun's not horrible. We'll talk a little bit about some of its shortcomings, but overall not horrible. You can find these out there actually for sale a little bit cheaper than their MSRP, but you're probably gonna pay 450 or better for one. Um, I think I paid 525 for this one. So certainly up there for a 22. Not expensive for a 1911, but very expensive for a 22. There's another thing that I didn't really think about when I got mine, and we're gonna talk about a Colt Walther. Um, 1911-22 as well, is I have a lot of holsters um, for full-size 1911s. The 85% frame doesn't fit into any of them. Not that I would actually carry a 22 caliber 1911, but it is really nice to have a holster when you're out there at the range to be able to put one in, and this just absolutely will not match up with any full-size 1911 accessories which makes it kind of annoying. Uh, kind of is one of the cool features that these things have is they have these standard style 1911 A1 sights and that looks really cool. It adds a little bit to the historical accuracy of the gun. However, they're absolutely terrible. They always have been. That's one of the reasons when we look at modern 1911s, we don't see sights like this on any kind of reasonably expensive 1911 out there. The real cheap 1911s will have those and we're going to do a full 1911 special and, and we'll talk about dirt cheap 1911s, mid-range, expensive and even some custom builds in 1911s and we'll talk about the differences and what you get for your money in those but for today I just really think this gun comes up short on the value scale. And that's the reason we gave it a value score of 2.1 out of a possible five stars. So pretty low there. The next thing that we always talk about on all of our guns is ease of use. 
We gave this gun a 3.5 on ease of use. It is really just like any other 1911 in the way that it takes down, comes apart, reassembly, um, cleaning, all that good kind of stuff. 1911s are a little bit more difficult to maintain, clean, and keep up than some of your other guns, but there's plenty of information out there on these on how to do that. They're not horribly difficult. They've got a little bit of a learning curve, but not bad at all. And this is going to be just like any other 1911, which for those of us who have other 1911s, makes it a really good choice. One downside to these that you don't experience on other 1911s is the fact that it's got a magazine disconnect. If you don't know what a magazine disconnect is, when the magazine is in the firearm, the firearm will operate like it should. If you remove the magazine, it will not fire. It's designed and put into the gun as a safety feature. With that being said, it is not a feature that I like. I like to be able to continue to run the gun once the magazine is empty or removed from the gun. And it's one of the ways that I will often at the range be sure a gun is clear is I will remove the magazine and drop the hammer on one so I know it's not gonna feed another round. It makes me feel a little bit more comfortable with a firearm and having that um, feature on this, I feel like is more of a safety hazard than a benefit. One thing I will say on ease of use score for these is if you have small hands, um, arthritis, or for a um, you know smaller uh, kid even, the size of these makes them easier to learn and train on than a full-size 1911. Um, they fit in smaller hands a lot better than most 1911s. And another just a size thing out there that you have to consider when getting one of these is this back grip safety here. You've got to engage it with your hand. One of the problems that I have is with a very high grip on this gun, I have a tendency not to engage it all the way and uh, that's a little bit of a problem. So ease of use, 3.5 out of 5 for the Browning 1911-22. We always have to talk about fun factor when we're reviewing guns. This is one of the parts where any good functioning, high quality, 22 caliber handguns are really going to shine. These are an absolute blast to shoot. Uh, of course, relatively inexpensive to run in 22 LR and just a total and complete blast. Almost no recoil. They're cheap to run so you can shoot it all day long. They hold up fairly well to large amounts of rounds without getting dirty. I've never really had any issues with this thing. Of course, it is a 22. Rimfire rounds are somewhat unreliable but I haven't had any more failures than I would expect out of a normal 22 with this guy compared to other guns out there. Very, very fun gun to shoot. Absolute blast at the range. Really highly recommend this as a range toy because they are just incredibly fun. So we're gonna give the Browning 1911 22 a score of four out of five in the fun factor. We always talk about reliability when we're reviewing handguns here on Tack and Track. I probably got in the neighborhood of 2,000 rounds through this particular gun. Uh, I've had it for a little while, been shooting it, enjoy it quite a lot. Some of the things that we need to talk about on reliability. For one, anytime you're shooting a rimfire ammunition, they're not going to be horribly reliable. That's not necessarily the gun's fault. A lot of that comes into quality of ammunition and just the way that the ammunition is manufactured, not always gonna be horribly reliable. There is one particular problem with this gun and its size giving it a reliability problem. And that's this back grip safety here. That needs to be fully engaged in order to let the hammer fall. And one of the things that I've noticed with a full size adult hand on this is this back grip is sometimes hard to engage down here fully in order to depress that in order to let the hammer fall. 
That's one of the reasons this is going to score a little bit lower than some of the other guns is it's a 22 and this back grip safety is a little bit of a problem to engage so it's going to get a score of 3 out of 5 in the reliability factor. One of the important features that we always talk about is accuracy. Accuracy out of this guy is probably not as good as it should be. And the main reason for that is going to be the sights. It's not that the gun isn't mechanically accurate. It's that the sights are a little bit of a struggle to pick up a good picture with and set up well. It does have a 4.1 inch barrel. I've just never been particularly good with these sights and I've never liked shooting with them. And my accuracy has suffered to some degree because of the sights. Mechanically, it's quite accurate. Um, I think just as good as the other 1911-22s we'll talk about. But 22s are never horribly accurate. Um, and the sights really, really don't do this gun any justice whatsoever. So with that being said, we're going to give it an accuracy score of 2.6 out of 5. The trigger pull on this thing is not great. One hand in the hand tends to So it can be done, but especially one handed, I have a tendency to kind of push this trigger a little bit, and it it does not perform particularly well at this range and the sights on this are not as good as what we see on modern 1911s and certainly not as good as what I'm used to shooting and uh, accuracy suffers because of it. So for an overall score on the Browning we're gonna go just over three out of five. They're incredibly fun guns to shoot. The history behind these is really cool. Uh, the fact that John Moses Browning's companies actually back making 1911 designed handguns is really cool. I couldn't pass on that. With that being said, if your question is really, should I buy one of these? The answer is gonna be generically across the board, no. Um, with that being said, there are a few things this gun's really good at, especially for smaller hands, any kind of arthritic issues, that kind of stuff. And I think it's a historically significant firearm to have. That being said, it's, its price point is really way too high for what you get. And I've been overall disappointed in this gun uh, ever since I got it. With that being said, I'm not going to get rid of it anytime soon. I do enjoy having it.